Welcome to the Vegan Pulse. I am your host, Nancy Arenas, with another segment of Making Sense with Gabriel, with our guest, Gabriel Garden. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hi, Gabriel. How are you? And welcome back to Making Sense with Gabriel. That's you. Awesome. Thanks, Nancy. I'm doing well. How about you? Good. Thank you. Today's question is, can you obtain and absorb adequate iron from plant-based sources? Another great question. We recently spoke about calcium. And so, yeah, new, iron is another one of those nutrients of concern or just an important nutrient that we need to consider on a plant-based diet. Really an omnivorous diet as well, because if we don't get enough iron, it's one of those tricky nutrients, then we can become anemic. And that's something that we definitely want to avoid. But iron is one of those nutrients that can, it's kind of considered a double-edged sword nutrient, because if you're not getting enough of it, that's very problematic because you can become anemic and that's a dangerous thing, can really impact your overall health and quality of life. But on the other side, the flip side, the, you know, the double-edged sword, if you get too much iron, that's also dangerous, you know, something that we want to avoid. And the really beautiful thing about plant-based diets is that we don't have to worry so much about getting too much. We do need to worry about getting enough, right? Because it's possible. People can certainly become anemic on <clears throat> vegan plant-based diets. Um, but we don't have to worry nearly as much as people who consume, consume an, an omnivorous diet or a diet that includes meat and animal products about getting too much. And again, too much iron is a bad thing. It's been associated with in, in, in you know, many different uh, scientific investigations and, and different research studies associated with an increased risk for a number of different chronic diseases, right? And so too much iron is a bad thing, but too little iron is also a concern. And so we want to make sure to eat iron rich foods. And so same thing. I recently did this on our calcium episode, plant, plant foods, rich in iron, you know, and anybody can do this on Google, right? Good plant sources of iron include lentils, chickpeas, beans, tofu. So the first one, two, three, the first four things on the list, those were all foods that come from the legume family, right? Legumes include any type of bean. So think black bean, pinto bean, you know, kidney bean, throw any bean in there. Think different types of peas, and those include chickpeas and split peas. And then any type of lentil, red lentils, brown lentils, green lentils, black lentils. I think there's even white lentils, right? We don't see a lot of these lentils in our culture. But if you go to Tallinn Market, they have a wider variety of lentils because these lentils are more widely consumed in other parts of the world. Then you'll see them classically in a lot of American food or food in this region of the world, kind of in the Western Hemisphere. So again, lentils beans and any type of pea like chickpeas and split peas are going to be great sources of iron and then think about and then the, the the other foods that come right up on this google search cashew nuts chia seeds um linseed which is also flax seed hemp seeds pumpkin seeds so right after our legumes come different types of nuts and seeds so think about beans or legumes and nuts and seeds as being great sources of iron right pumpkin seeds or i, I think I, I mentioned that one but all great sources. I think uh, another one that's not on here is tahini, which is the ground toasted sesame seed, right? Tahini, I think, is another great source. But with any of these sources of iron on a plant-based diet, we want to make sure to consume them simultaneously with a rich source of vitamin C. So, and some of these iron-rich sources aren't, you know, some of them probably have uh, significant amounts of vitamin C, but often they don't. So we want to make sure to pair them up with a vitamin C rich food. So with vitamin C, number one in New Mexico, think green chili. Green chili has a ton of vitamin C in it. Broccoli, different types of dark leafy greens. Bell peppers are another wonderful source of vitamin C. Tomatoes, right? And so all of these foods that are rich, and then of course, vitamin C also citrus, right? Any kind of citrus is great. So when we're thinking about nuts and seeds, I would say, oh, nuts and seeds, they go great with any type of citrus fruit. Right. You could put those on a breakfast cereal or whatever it might be um, great or just for a snack, like some pumpkin seeds with an orange or any type of citrus. Um, my, mango, I believe, is also a wonderful source of vitamin C. So when you're thinking vitamin C, you're thinking fruits and vegetables. And then when you're thinking iron, you're thinking things like beans and different types of legumes and nuts and seeds. Right. 
And then dried apricots and figs are also great sources of iron. So we even get iron in some fruit sources like dried apricots and figs, raisins, quinoa. And then the last thing that's listed here is fortified breakfast cereal. So of course, just like we mentioned with calcium, you can also turn to fortified foods to get iron as well. But I would always recommend that people are getting the vast majority of the food that they consume from whole plant foods. And whole foods are not going to be fortified because they're you know, minimally or unprocessed. So again, if you're getting enough of the legume, legumes are important for so many different reasons because they're so rich in protein, they're so high in fiber, and they're also, and, and one of the fibers that they have is called resistant starch, beautiful compound. Basically it's a starch, you know, starch is a form of carbohydrate that we consume. And then our body breaks it down to its simplest form called glucose. And then our body uses glucose to create energy, to create a, a product called ATP that we use to power all of our body cells. But with resistant starch, it's basically a starch that's resistant to digestion. So our body has a hard time breaking down resistant starch, and it makes its way all the way down to our large intestine where all of our gut bugs live. They eat on the resistant starch and they produce all these beautiful compounds like short chain fatty acids, which are wonderful for our health. They reduce our risk for chronic disease. They actually curb our hunger drive. So they prevent us from overeating. So they're great for preventing obesity and overweight and or helping us lose weight if we have excess pounds that we want to get rid of. So beans are good for a million reasons. So, and one of them happens to be they're good. They're also rich in iron. So I was going to so give us a couple of examples of those resistant starches. Well, like I say, beans, any type of legume is going to be is going to be rich in resistant starch. Another great thing that you can do is with things like pasta and potatoes, if you cook them, but then you cool them in the refrigerator, right? So any of your leftovers that you don't eat immediately, or if you're making something like a plant-based potato salad, you know you're going to have to cool it before you eat it anyway. But when you cool a lot of these foods that are rich in starch, you cool, you cool them down until they're cold in the refrigerator, and then you can either eat them cold, or even if you heat them back up, you reheat your pasta the next day to have your pasta with red sauce or your pasta with pesto. People need to check out our calcium episode to hear more about that homemade pesto that I was talking about. You can reheat them. And even after reheating, if they've been cooked and then they've been cooled to cold once, even if you reheat it, it still maintains some of this resistant starch that's built up during that cooling process. So something really cool that happens. So yeah, so think about, you know, just reheating some of those starchy foods like potatoes and pasta. And then anytime you're eating a bean or a, or a split pea or a chickpea or any type of lentil, any of those legumes, you're going to be getting a little bit of that resistant starch. And it's just a wonderful compound. Now that's separate from our, our iron discussion, but it's just another great reason that I want to highlight for viewers and listeners to eat more beans, right? To eat more legumes because they're rich in iron and they're rich in protein and they're rich in resistant starch and all these other beautiful compounds that are really essential to living a healthy life. And some people will say, hey man, you know, I understand that I need to eat more beans because they're such a great source of iron, but they give me bloating and they make me uncomfortable and they give me gas. And that's where I'll give you two terms, slow, you gotta go slow and you gotta start, wait, what is the, sorry, I'm just spacing out, slow and, oh, low and slow, slow and low. And what that means is you start low, right? You start low. So if you haven't, if you're not a bean eater right now and your body's not used to digesting those rich amounts of fiber that I'm talking about, which create that bloating and excess gas, then you need to start low, meaning start with a little bit of a time, even if it's only one, be one spoonful of beans. Now, anybody could eat one spoonful of beans, right? So open up a can of no salt added beans. It'll last for days in the refrigerator, put it in a Tupperware, and then eat one spoonful a day because that's going to be such a low amount that it's not going to aggravate your body. But do it every day because the, the most important thing with any dietary change or any lifestyle change is you got to do it consistently, right? So eat one spoonful every single day if you have issues with beans. Or start with lentils. Lentils, generally speaking, are a little bit easier for people to digest than are different types of beans. So start with lentils, start low, and go slow right? And so slow meaning I'm only going to eat that one spoonful or just, you know, maybe a quarter cup instead of a half a cup or a full cup of beans. 
And I'm going to do that every day for a week or two, right? So I'm going to slow and then slowly I'm going to increase the amount of beans that I eat over time. So the first week or two, I only eat one or two spoonfuls. The second week, I'm going to essentially double that. And then I'm going to do that consistently every day for a week or two more. Your body's then going to get used to that. And then you can keep going up until you're like me. I'll eat as many as like three cups of beans every single day, right? Because they're so good for us. And they're a great replacement for a lot of the high protein foods that people would think of on an animal based or on, on an omnivorous diet when they're eating steak and chicken and fish and eggs and all these other foods that are rich in protein. But of course they have a bet. They have the baggage of having a lot of nutrients that are not beneficial for our health with beans. We get all that awesome protein and we get all these other great compounds that are so essential for our overall health and the prevention of chronic disease and cancer. Well, and that, you know, I didn't know that, but that's great. Low and slow. Uh, because I've had that question like asked to me, you know, or, or not the question, but I've been told I can't eat beans because it gives me gas and makes me bloat. But uh, your suggestion of low and slow will help them because most of these people are like people who have gut uh, problems. And so this would actually help them if they actually just incrementally, you know, eat the beans. Exactly. Low and slow. That's another great term that I learned from Simon Hill. He runs a podcast called Plant Proof. He's got a great book called The Proof is in the Plants that I recommend everybody check out if they want to do a deep dive on nutrition and why plant-based, you know, vegan diets are so good for our health and good for animals and the planet. And so check out the proof is in the plants. And there was one other point I had about beans. Yes. And then of course, you know, pressure cooking is also great. We cook them in a pressure cooker, just adding all that pressure to the cooking, soaking the beans before you cook them. There's a number of other different strategies that we can use to help, you know, just kind of increase the digestibility and make them a little bit easier. But generally speaking, people aren't going to have a problem with beans if they just go low and slow and the people often that have the most issue digesting beans are the people that need them the most, right? Because like you said, they have something called gut dysbiosis taking place where they have a gut that's injured, you know, that's inflamed because they've eaten a diet that's low in fiber historically. That's a standard American diet that's rich in animal products and processed foods. And their gut is literally starving for the different types of fibers that are rich in all these whole plant foods. The problem is because they don't have the diverse microbiome that's needed, the diverse gut bacteria that are needed to break down all this fiber. That's why they suffer so much when they try to eat it because they don't have the right kinds of bacteria to break it down. But we can develop those bacteria, but we just have to give our gut time, right? If you can't go from being a couch potato to a marathon runner overnight, you can't go from a standard American diet to a whole food plant-based amazing diet overnight either. Some people can, but some people don't have the gut that's ready for it. So that's the same thing. It's training. It's just like exercise and training for a race or training for a, a physical competition. We have to gradually make change over time. And then our body gradually adapts to those changes. And before you know it, in a month or two or three or six months, depending on the level of gut dysbiosis that people have, if you put in the consistency and you put in the work, everybody can get there or, or virtually everybody can get there. You just have to be consistent and, and, and continue to low and slow over time. Wow. Thank you again for another episode with great information. I always learn something every time we do this show. And the slogan for this week is low and slow. Until next time. Hasta luego. Thank you for joining us on another Vegan Pulse. I am your host, Nancy Arenas. Remember, like us on Facebook, check out our website, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. The vegan. <laughs>